Let's reconvene, yeah? So, and evaluate, yeah, that expression, yeah, for the case when tau is equal to zero. We are seeing, we are interested in the expression of gamma one, two, for tau equals zero. So this is equal to time average of V1 conjugate complex times V2 times T divided by I. So you see I need a drawing here. So we will assume now that the extended source we are looking at here, so which is very distant, yeah, out of the blackboard of course, yeah. Is composed of a many small infinitesimal surface element that you see projected on the sky, yeah? where their number it goes from one to big N. So the visible surface yeah, is just integration of all these small surface elements. And what we may write is that, of course, yeah, at point P1, the electric field yeah, is just a contribution of the electric fields due to all these infinitesimally small surface elements. Yeah? So I may write that V1 of t is summation from 1 to n of Vi1, where Vi1 means that contribution yeah, of the surface element i at the point 1. It's the same for the second hole. And what we do now, where we just insert this expression in that one, and V2 in that one. And then, you know, we will have a uh, well, series yeah, of uh, cross products, yeah, many cross products. And what we obtain yeah, is the following. We have a series of a summation on just one index, yeah, vi1, vi2. So it's one surface element contributing to the whole one and whole two. We are looking at the correlations. And then we have all the contributions, yeah, due to surface element, which are distinct, i, j, contributing yeah, at point one or two. Well, because the source elements are emitting light in an incoherent way, yeah, so there is no possible interference between the light emitting, emitted by two different surface elements. Yeah? Well, on average, yeah, this summation is just equal to zero, yeah, because it's just random numbers. Yeah? So what remains? is the other summation. So the summation from i equal 1 to n, the time average of the i1 star t time the i2 of t divided by i. Okay, now do you agree that the i1 or yeah wait what i will write now just a reminder of uh, this expression for the small surface elements yeah so i don't write it down on the blackboard yeah for an incoherent, incoherent light source i said the second summation appearing here is obviously equal to zero and the contributions v i j can be expressed as well this is essentially this expression, yeah? But where I've taken into account the, the effect of the dilution, geometrical dilution, yeah? Because there is a distance, yeah, between uh, the source element and where you are, yeah? And we know that the intensity, yeah, varies as the inverse of the square of the distance. So it means that the amplitude, yeah, varies as the inverse of the distance. And this is the reason why you see here a division by or I1, which is the distance between the surface element I and the, the whole number one. Okay, now if I would like to evaluate yeah, what the value of this product, I make use of those relations and I find that it's equal to, so after we'll take the time average, it will be Contribution, this is the real amplitude yeah, due, due to the surface element i, taken at the time t minus r i1 over c. This is the propagation time, yeah, correction for propagation time from source element i yeah, to the whole number one. 
divided yeah by r i1 to count for the di geometric dilution effect yeah multiply by so here i conjugate complex exponentiation of minus i to pi nu multiplied by t minus r i1 over c now multiply by a i t minus r i2 over c divided by r i2 now the first thing I will do yeah, is the following yeah? so this is the distance from surface element i to hole 1 and this is the distance from surface element i to hole 2 would you agree that I can do that or not? It is as if I would be dividing yeah, by, okay, maybe uh, 10,000 light years and 10,000 light years plus one centimeter, yeah? So it doesn't make any difference, yeah? So this is easy. Now, the next thing, yeah, next approximation is the following. If I assume that the difference between those distances, yeah, is much smaller than the coherence length. Well, which is what? Well, it is C divided by delta nu. So this is uh, the light velocity, and this is the period of the bit phenomenon, yeah? which is also equal to lambda square over delta lambda. So if I sh assume this, yeah, what I can do is to say that, well, these two amplitudes yeah, are the same because the amplitude yeah, varies uh, well, as a function of the distance yeah, with the wavelength, which is the coherence length. So if this, the difference in distance is much smaller, I can say that, well, this is the same as this one. Yeah? So here I put number one. Yeah? Because here maybe the amplitude is that, and just a little bit farther, it's still there. And it, it, it decreases very slowly, very slowly. Yeah? You see? So this is the approximation I make. Then I can do that. Now what I do, I just say, OK. Yeah. OK. I can do that, yeah, as long as the difference between the distances from source element i to hole 1 or 2 yeah, is much smaller than the co coherence length. Yeah? So this is the significance of the co coherence length. So in the experiment of Michael Sonia, yeah, you have to make sure that the difference between the distances coming from distant source yeah, to the focal plane yeah, is less than the coherence length, yeah, either going through the whole one or going through the whole two. OK, so this is what I'm getting. And now what I should still do is uh, to take the time average yeah, and to sum over all the source elements. Yeah. OK, so now, here I forgot something. Yeah? You agree that I'd written this, but I forgot to write the other one. I to P new T, and now minus R I2 over C. This I'd forgotten, yeah? Yeah, because when I... I wrote yeah, this contribution, so I made use of this, well, of the first part, it was okay, of this, and now for the second one, yeah, I made use of that, but I should also make use of that. Yeah? Now, when I see that the temporal time contribution goes away, because of the minus, yeah, but there remains something, yeah? So when I make the product of the two, what I find is that exponentiation of minus 2 pi nu multiplied by r i2 minus r i1 over c. Now here, it's a question to you. Do I have the right to replace here the number one by number two or not? No. 
Why? The reason is that now, the frequency here is not delta nu. It's not this low time dependence or, or space dependence, yeah? It's something of the order of lambda, the wavelengths, yeah? Which is short, yeah? So this quantity varies very much, yeah? As a function of the wavelengths, yeah? So here I have no right to do that, yeah? Okay. So, what do I do next? I just uh, show you where we are. So, this is essentially uh, this quantity and this one, with the condition that I made the assumption that the difference between the two distances yeah, is smaller than the coherence length. Now, the quantity I represent here, so the square of the module of the real amplitude of the electric field by the surface element i, yeah, I can represent it as being equal to what? Where the intensity at that location, yeah, multiplied by the surface element, okay? So you agree, yeah? the square of an amplitude is an intensity, but I have to take into account the size of the source element I'm considering, which is infinitesimal, yeah? But I have to take it into account, yeah? And now, when after I make what? I make the time average, so I take the time average, with before a summation. So let's start again. First, I make the summation on i from 1 to n. And I, after I take the time average, so here I make summation on i from 1 to n. Then I take the time average. What do I find? Well, I find the following. I find that it is equal. I replace the summation on i by an integration over the surface, yeah? So it's a double integral, yeah, if you want. It's i, s, t, s. So I've taken into account this. Now I have to divide by the square of the distance, yeah, of the source element. So this is taking into account this effect. So all of this I've taken into account. And now I should still include that one, times the exponentiation complex of minus i2 pi nu times r i2 minus r i1 divided by c. Okay, so this is what the complex degree of mutual coherence is equal to. So it's equal to a integration over the surface of the source, yeah? of its intensity divided by the geometrical dilution effect and corrected for this factor. And this is uh, what we have established now is known as the Van Sitter Zernike theorem. Okay. So this is the Zernike Van Sitter theorem. Now in all of that, yeah, I forgot to one thing. Yeah? You, you see here, I, I have divided by i. Here I have divided by i. Here I have forgotten to divide by i. So I correct for this, I divide by i. And here, whoop, I also divide by i, where i is the uh, intensity of the source. Yeah, yeah, so integrated intensity of the source. Okay, this is already a very interesting result, yeah, but which can which which can still be simplified, yeah, due to uh, several obvious assumptions, yeah. So in what follows, yeah, we will assume that was the source is an extension, so an extension which is small compared to the distance between the source and the observer. So this is a very good assumption, yeah? And also that the distance between the two points 
which is part of my interferometer, yeah? so the distance, the baseline, is small compared to the distance between the source and the observer. Yeah? So double assumption, yeah? but which is obvious. This is known as the Fraunhofer approximation. Yeah? So I assume that the extent of the source and that the distance between the two elements of my interferometers yeah, is small compared to the distance. Yeah? Well, here typically, yeah, we have a maximum 400 meters. Yeah? And here, typically, yeah, you have uh, 100 of light years. Yeah? So good approximation. And also about the, the extent of the source. Yeah? So we should make use of that those two assumptions yeah, to simplify yeah, the zernike van Sittert theorem by this expression too. Well, integration of the, over the surface of the source divided by i of the exponentiation of minus i to i nu multiplied by r i2 minus r i1 divided by c. I want. Okay. Okay. So this is a diagram yeah, showing you the source, which is very distant here. Yeah? And I represented a source element with a surface DSI. And the point PI is yeah, coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime. Now, my system of coordinates yeah, is centered on one of the elements of my interferometer, in this case, P2. Well, it's not uh, important. This is Cartesian coordinate 0, 0, 0. X goes in that direction, Y goes in that direction, and Z goes in that direction. And what we are assuming yeah, is that the distance Z prime, so the distance between this element and the source, is much bigger than the module of X prime, Y prime, module of x or module of y. So the distance between the two elements of my interferometer or the extent of the source. That's all, yeah? OK, now let's evaluate yeah, what is R2 minus R1. And this is something very similar to what we've done yesterday. Yeah? So well, let's calculate yeah, the module of the difference between P2 Pi minus P1 Pi. Yeah. So we find the following that is equal to the module of, so P2 Pi, it's easy, yeah? P2 Pi is just the square root of x prime square plus y prime square plus z prime square. minus the square root of P1 Pi. So P1 Pi will be x minus x prime square plus y minus y prime square plus uh, z prime square. So we, we assume, of course, that the two elements of the interferometers yeah, is in the plane xy. Yeah? for z equals 0. OK. So his last time, what, what we do then, yeah? We just put z, z, z prime square yeah, in evidence. So it will be z prime multiplied by the square root of 1 plus x prime square plus y prime square divided by z prime square, like this, minus so I can do like that, square root of 1 plus x minus x prime square plus y minus y prime square divided by z prime square. Yeah. Now I make use yeah, of uh, the Taylor development in series yeah, of the square root of 1 plus epsilon. Yeah. So it will be 1 plus x prime square plus y prime square divided by 2 z prime square 
then after will be minus 1, then minus x minus x prime square plus, so here is, will be also minus y minus y prime square divided by 2 z prime square, like that, if I didn't make a mistake. So the 1 the plus 1 minus 1 goes away. Now the z prime here goes away with the z prime square here. Now, when I will raise this at the power 2, the x prime square or the x prime square will go away. So what will remain is just equal to minus x square plus y square like this divided by 2z prime and after plus the double products yeah? so it will be plus 2 so it will be x times x prime plus y times y prime divided by z prime yeah? if I didn't make a mistake yeah? okay now we will define yeah, angular coordinates. So the angular coordinates are zeta equal x prime divided by z prime and eta equal to y prime divided by z prime. So what do they represent physically? Yeah? So if you divide x prime, so x is along that direction, so, so x prime, by z prime, yeah, is a tangent of the angle under which you see that source element, yeah, okay. So it's really a, an angular coordinates expressed in regions, yeah. It's the same for the other angular coordinates. So here, I find that it will be equal to minus. Well, I could say okay, x square plus y square divided by 2z prime now plus x times zeta plus y times eta right in such a way that this expression here so gamma 1 2 for tau equal to 0 will be equal to what well, now I put a double integral because I shall integrate yeah, over the special coordinates or angular coordinates. Yeah? So how I, I will do, it's okay, it's the intensity, which depends on zeta, eta, multiplied by the exponentiation of minus 2 pi mu, multiplied by well, divided by c, of course. Now c over nu, it's lambda. Yeah. So here, the c over nu, I can replace it by 2 pi over lambda. Now here, I may write x times zeta plus y times eta, correct? Yes. Then I close my parentheses. And now, in fact, what I should write here, yeah, is time dx prime times dy prime, and then divided by the distance, yeah? And the distance, well, I think I, I forget it, I forgot it here, right? I forgot it here, yeah? So here it was a r square, yeah? Something like that. Well, which in this case, the r square becomes uh, divided by z prime and by z prime, yeah, yeah, because it's a distance. But now dx prime over z prime, it's d zeta, so this is just d zeta, and dy prime divided by z prime is d eta. Now I still have to divide this by i, and it's not finished. I forgot to write down this factor which does not depend on the angular coordinates. Yeah? So multiply by exponentiation of 
I think I call it I phi xy, something like that, yeah? Where phi xy is equal to what? Well, it's equal to, just a moment, it will be, well, minus 2 pi times nu over c, so over lambda, multiplied by x square plus y square divided by 2z prime, something like that, yeah? Okay? But this is just a term which does not depend on the source, yeah? It just depends on uh, the two elements of the interferometer. So let's see whether we did a mistake or not. Okay, here I can put plus or minus, yeah? Plus or minus doesn't matter. Take a double integration of the intensity times exponentiation of minus i2 pi, yeah, zeta x theta, and divided by lambda, then zeta d eta, it's correct. And now here, well, e, the difference in the node is that I've defined now a normalized intensity, i zeta eta, as being equal to i zeta eta divided by hi, and hi is equal to simply uh, i zeta eta d zeta d eta. Yeah? So this is normalized intensity. Yeah? So well, when you integrate yes, this intensity over the source, you find it's equal to 1. Okay? And this is why so you obtain the same expression but with high prime. Yeah? So the final result yeah, is the following is that the complex degree of mutual coherence, gamma 1, 2, which depends on which parameter, yeah? Oh, this is interesting. I will isolate, yeah, here, x over lambda. So here I write x over lambda. Here, the lambda y over lambda. Therefore, here I have the right to put x over lambda, y over lambda. Now, tau equals 0. Is equal to what? A double integration of i prime times exponentiation of minus i2 pi multiplied by zeta oops, times x over lambda plus eta y over lambda d zeta d eta. I see, and now multiply, yeah, still by the other quantity, exponential, plus or minus i phi x y. Now, what is nice is that, you know, the visibility of the fringes is equal to the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence. If I take the module of that, this goes away. And what I see is that, wow, the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence is equal to the Fourier transform of the distribution of a normalized intensity at the surface of the source. Yeah? And this is a fantastic result, of course. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, you see here what, what is, well, I even see that this is the origin of the Fourier transform. Yeah? So it comes from optics. Yeah? From the Van Sittert Mechanical Theorem, yeah, but which was found independently yeah, by by Fourier, and uh, well, we see that there is a big potential of applications here, yeah. So let's just remember that okay, the visibility is a module of this quantity of the complex degree of mutual coherence, so it is a module of that quantity, or oh, which is just a Fourier transform in two dimensions, yeah, of the distribution of the normalized intensity at the surface of the source. Coherence. You see, it depends on the on the parameter x over lambda and y over lambda, yeah. So, x over lambda and y over lambda. Now, I would like to to find out with you what is the physical 
uh, meaning of x over lambda and y over lambda, yeah? OK. You agree if I tell you, well, t yeah, is a period yeah, of oscillation, the inverse of t, 1 over t, is a frequency, right? It's a frequency. Now, if I take lambda over x, lambda over x, you agree? We, we've seen yeah, uh, that following uh, a redisk, yeah, following, uh, well, the FISO interferometer, we've seen that lambda over b is angular resolution of our interferometer where b is the baseline. Yeah? So here it's the same. This is angular resolution, yeah, where lambda is the wavelength, and x is the baseline. x is the distance yeah, between uh, two elements along the x direction. Yeah? Well, lambda over y is, of course, uh, angular resolution yeah, along the y direction. Yeah? Now, if I take 1 over lambda over x, well, this is equal to x over lambda. Yeah? But taking the inverse of that is taking a frequency. And because this is an angular coordinate, this is, this is what? It's a space frequency. So it's an angular space frequency. And well, people have taken the habit of uh, calling this the space frequency x as being x over lambda in v the y over lambda. So these are space, well, angular space frequencies. Yeah? But in the literature, they don't call them angular space frequencies. They call them space frequencies. Yeah? But remember, why frequencies? It's because lambda over x is an angle, is angular resolution yeah, of your instrument. Yeah? So if you take the inverse, it's a frequency. So angular space frequencies. <laughs> And they are named where well, the UV coordinates and where UV plane comes from, yeah? The UV plane, yeah? So, okay, so let's rewrite all of that. Gamma 1, 2 of the angular space frequencies UV as a function of zero is equal to, where well, the exponentiation of plus or minus i phi xy multiplied by the Fourier transform of the normalized distribution of the intensity at the surface of the source, of which I'm taking the Fourier transform. So it's zeta u plus eta v, like this, d zeta d eta. Yeah? Now, what is obvious, yeah, is that what you are going to do, yeah, you are going to take measurements, yeah, of the module of that quantity, of course, yeah. So if you take the module of that quantity, this goes away. You take the module of that quantity. Now let's concentrate, yeah, just on the on the Fourier transform, yeah. Well, would you agree that what you would like to recover, yeah? So it's i prime as a function of zeta eta with a superangular resolution given by that of your interferometer, yeah? So what you will do, yeah? Well, you will just try to take many, many, a very good sampling of the UV plane measuring the visibility of the fringes. And after, if you take the inverse Fourier transform of that quantity, yeah? You should recover the distribution intensity of the source with an angular resolution that would be given by a single dish which diameter is along this baseline, yeah? along well, the direction of interest. Now you would like to do that yeah, for many different directions, many different baselines, so it means many different space frequencies. Yeah? And for that you will take advantage of the Hertz rotation, of course, and by moving uh, one element of the interferometer with a with the other, yeah? Then you will make what, what is known as a, as a uh, aperture synthesis, yeah? Aperture synthesis, yeah. Now, the, the problem with the telescope, optical telescopes, is that you have very few elements, yeah? The, I think the Shara 
Shara Ray has uh, six elements, yeah, which is already nice, yeah, because uh, when uh, you use uh, six telescope, yeah, you may at one time, yeah, uh, get uh, 15, 15 frequencies, yeah, right. So it's a C six two number of combination yeah, of uh, six elements taken two by two. With the VLT, yeah, you only get six at a time. But with the Earth rotation, yeah, well, you you may succeed yeah, in covering rather well the, the plane. And then, well, as the VLT, they have auxiliary telescopes, four small auxiliary telescopes, which can be moved, yeah, moved along rails. And this goes very fast. So during the night, yeah, you may take uh, many uh, different configurations, which is nice, yeah. So just uh, as a reminder, we could say, OK, I prime zeta eta is the inverse Fourier transform of that, yeah? So we'll say, OK, it's equal to the double integration of. Well, in principle, we should uh, reinsert here the this quantity multiplied by gamma 1, 2, u, v, 0, time exponentiation of inverse Fourier transform. Now the minus sign has disappeared. Zeta u plus v eta. And now du d eta. Yeah? So this is the magic yeah, of the interferometry by taking the inverse Fourier transform. Yeah? If you make a large number of measurements yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence, it means uh, you know, visibilities uh, for different configuration of your telescopes. You pave uh, very well yeah, the UV plane. And by taking the inverse Fourier transform, you recover. You make aperture synthesis imaging yeah, with an interferometer. Yeah. OK, now we have time yeah, still to make maybe a few applications. OK. Yeah, I have said all of that. So, well, let's first remind yeah, some uh, properties of the Fourier transform. Yeah? And uh, so I just remind you that in one dimension, yeah, the Fourier transform of the function f of x yeah, is integration from minus infinity to plus infinity time exponentiation of minus 2 i pi time s x dx. Yeah? And this is a nice formulation of the Fourier transform because when you take the inverse Fourier transform, where the coefficient you have bef well, just before the integration yeah, is always 1. Yeah? Otherwise, something is 1 over square root of 2 pi complications which are unnecessary. Yeah? So this is a one-dimension Fourier transform. Now you just say the functions, yeah, the original function and its Fourier transform form a Fourier pair. Now the Fourier transform of that function exists if the function f(x) yeah, is bounded, summable, and has a finite number of extrema and or discontinuities. Yeah. Now this does not necessarily mean that the inverse Fourier transform, yeah, denoted f t minus one of f t f, yeah will give you f, yeah? Well, for it to happen, yeah, what you need is that uh, the following integrals yeah, must exist, yeah? So if it's not bounded, yeah, then you cannot find, recover the inverse Fourier transform. But if, it, well, this is usually the case, yeah? So the inverse Fourier transform, yeah, is just the Fourier transform times this, yeah? So what we've seen there, yeah? These are just reminders, yeah? Now, we can, of course, generalize, generalize the Fourier transform to several dimensions, so n dimensions, yeah? So the Fourier transform yeah, of a function you do, which depends on a vector, yeah, w, is just this, yeah? Where here you have the scalar product yeah, of the vector w by the vector r. And it's what we've seen here. We, we already here have a Fourier transform in a two-dimensional space, yeah? But you can generalize it to any number of dimensions. OK, now, this is just a reminder, yeah? If a function ft designates a function of time, yeah? It's Fourier transform, yeah? 
well, as a content of a function of time frequencies. Yeah, this we know. So similarly, yeah, well, it's what we have seen here. If the function f, yeah, here it was the intensity, is defined yeah, on a two-dimensional space, then this function represents the special frequency content of the function f. Yeah? So it's what we have seen yeah? in terms of the UV frequencies. Now, among the interesting uh, properties that we shall make use yeah, very often in, in the exercise yeah, are the following for the linearity properties. So if uh, A is a constant, a real constant, the Fourier transform of a function f multiplied by a is just a, the, where the constant a multiplied by the Fourier transform of f. This is obvious, yeah? Now, the Fourier transform of the summation of two functions, where it's just the summation of the two Fourier, of their two, of their Fourier transform, yeah? This is obvious too. When it will not be so obvious, yeah, I will make the demonstration, yeah? Now, about symmetry and parity properties, yeah? Well, I don't make use of those, yeah? So I will, I will just skip, yeah, and go to the essential. Okay. Oops. Oh, this is a nice property because, well, we will make use of it, yeah, in a, well, may, very often, yeah? So I will just demonstrate this one, yeah? So, it, well, it's good to, refresh our memory and so let's make this exercise yeah so let's take the Fourier transform of the function f which depends on the variable x divided by the real constant a and the Fourier transform yeah is a function of s yeah so do you agree that this is equivalent to write that it's integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function f of x divided by a time exponentiation minus 2 pi x times s dx. So this is the definition. Yeah? So if there is any difficulty, yeah, just let me know. So let's make the change of variable y equal x over a which implies that dx is equal to a times dy. So we find that the free transform will be equal to integration. If a is positive, the integration limits will still be from minus infinity to plus infinity. If a is negative, yeah, it will be the reverse. It would be from plus infinity to minus infinity. Yeah? So I will make a the demonstration assuming that A is a real positive, okay? So in that case, it's from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function f of y times the exponentiation of minus 2 pi. Now x, x is equal to A times y. So I write here y times A times s. Now dx, it's di, dy times a. So this is equal to a times this quantity. And this quantity, you agree, is a Fourier transform of the function f of x, but not anymore for the variable s, but for the variable a times s. Okay, and this is uh, well, what is the result there? Yeah, so it's a simili sim similarity, yeah, uh, property. That the Fourier transform of function x divided by a is equal to a times the Fourier transform of f, but evaluated for the product of a by s. Now, if you make it the case a negative, what you find simply is that you have to put the module. Okay, interesting. Now, okay, the meaning of that is that the dilation of a function causes a contraction of its Fourier transform, yeah? Indeed, yeah? If A goes to zero, yeah? Well, or 
Okay. Well, if A goes to zero, this goes to zero, but here you know it goes to infinity, yeah? So it means that the Fourier transform, for instance, of a direct function will have a very wide content in space frequencies, and vice versa. If you have a very spread function, its uh, content in frequencies will be very narrow, yeah? Okay. Now, this is another very interesting property, the translation property, yeah? So, what about the translation property? So let's make the demonstration. So let's evaluate the Fourier transform of a function f, which depends of x minus a, and here variable s. So by definition, this is the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of f x minus a time exponentiation of minus 2 pi xs dx. You agree? This is the definition. Change of variable as before, y equal x minus a, which means that dy equal dx, and also that x will be equal to a plus y. So the free transform becomes integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of y, this is good, times exponentiation of minus 2 pi s times x, so times y, times dx dy. And now I still have an exponentiation of minus i2 pi a s, like that. Now, this is simply equal to exponentiation of minus i2 pi a s multiplied by the Fourier transform of the function f of x, well, which depends on the variable s. Yeah? So, And now, so meaning of that is that the translation of the function in its original space, yeah, this is a translation, corresponds to a phase rotation of its Fourier transform in the transformed space, yeah. Oh, now it's good. The door function, door function, yeah. So the door function, yeah, because it will be very often used also. So the door function, yeah, so this is x with 0. Now here is x equals 0 0.5, x equals minus 0 0.5. And the door function is defined as follows. It is 0. If the module yeah, of x is bigger than 0.5, and it is equal to 1, 1, here's 0, yeah, if it's less. Now, let's evaluate yeah, what is the Fourier transform of the door function. Well, it's easy, it's the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity, but Okay, I, I will just write it of this function time x s So I replace this function here yeah, by the boundary. So it will be from minus one half to plus one half of exponentiation of minus i two pi x s dx. Now change of variable as usually. So let y equal to minus y2 pi xs, which means that dx is equal to dy 
divided by minus i to pi s, like that. So the Fourier transform becomes equal to. Okay, when we have a minus one half here, here it will go to i pi s. Here it will go to minus i pi s of the exponentiation of y times dx, which is dy divided by minus i 2 pi times s. So now it's very easy to integrate this exponent, the exponential function. So it's just equal to, and we have a sign minus here, yeah? So it will be exponentiation of i pi s minus exponentiation of minus i pi s divided by 2i pi s. Now, this is easy, yeah? It will be 2 times i times the sine of pi s, yeah? So the 2i, we simplify with those, and what will remain is the sine of pi s divided by pi s. Yes? So the original function, so this is the sine cardinal function, yeah? This is the result, yeah? The Fourier transform of the door function, yeah? It's just a sine cardinal, yeah? Now, what is amazing, yeah? In the optical interferometry, yeah, it's very really useful to work with the square apertures or rectangular apertures because you are always using uh, door functions or window, window functions, yeah? Well, in theory, you would prefer yeah, to use circular apertures, yeah? yeah? And, uh, well, technically, yeah, this is more difficult, yeah? Not so much, but, well, for a theoretical physicist, not difficult, yeah? For an astronomer, yeah, well, it's a bit cumbersome, yeah? And now, wh what happens is that, okay, you can do all the theory yeah, with square or rectangular apertures, yeah? You'll get the very deep inside of interferometry. Now, if you want to be more rigorous, you use uh, circular apertures. And what you will find is that the th cardinal sign will become a Bessel function of first order, first order Bessel function. That's all. So it's interesting, yeah, during this long break until Monday, that you go back, yeah, in your textbook, yeah, and see, yeah, well, what's the definition of a first order Bessel function? Because next time when we meet, yeah, we'll make use of it, yeah? So because we, we don't want to be despised by theoretical physicists, yeah? yeah? And to, to show them that we also know how to handle those, yeah? Now something I would like to propose as an exercise for the next lecture to you is the following. So well, we've seen this nice theory about the uh, Fourier transform. Let's assume the following, yeah? I will make it very simple, yeah? that you observe in the sky, in two dimensions, a star, which is square, yeah? So I make things simple, yeah? Next time I'll make circular, but now square, yeah? And, uh, well, I, I assume that the angular size of the star, yeah, is zeta zero, and also along eta is also zeta zero, so it's a square, square star, yeah? Now I would like to ask you, yeah, to calculate for next time, yeah? What is the visibility of such a star if I use a, an interferometer with uh, two elements, yeah? Separated by a baseline B, yeah? And uh, to show me, yeah, what what is the result yeah, of observing a square star? So you have everything. Uh, we know that, okay, the visibility will be the module of uh, the complex degree of mutual coherence. Oh, which is a module of the Fourier transform of that quantity. So what you should find out, yeah? Well, we know that the angle zeta goes from minus zeta zero half to plus zero half. 
eta goes from minus zeta zero half plus zeta zero half. I zero, I prime, what is I prime? Well, it's a constant because it's uniformly bright. The star is uniformly bright, yeah? But it should be normalized in such a way that when you integrate your intensity over those coordinates, you find one. And then you will find, uh, yeah, what is the visibility, yeah, of observing a square star in the sky with an interferometer, yeah? So next time, yeah, uh, <laughs> I will ask, yeah, well, one of you, if you agree, yeah, to come and uh, show your results, yeah?